All right. So we'll continue our discussion, right? So any suggestions on whether this ensures mutual exclusion? Okay, Sandeep says yes. Any other suggestions? Okay, Vipin also agrees. Okay, so whether you are answering this question or not, I request everybody to please think about these questions. Uh, that is going to help your learning. Okay, so with victim, the thing is that it's always going to be one value similar to the flag, and that is going to essentially ensure that only one of them is going to enter the critical section. And therefore, the mutual exclusion is guaranteed, right? So that part seems to be good. But then there are issues with it. What are the issues? Deadlock. Uh, OK. Volatile reads rights are slow. OK. So, uh, Sandeep, what do you mean by deadlock here? Sir, uh, I guess if uh, two threads are executing this and uh, two threads keep the... Okay. Uh, let me read this. Yes. So in our previous code, where we had different flags for individuals, and everybody was waiting for the other flag to uh, become false, right? So while flag of other, uh, I'm going to wait, right? So that created a deadlock. But in this case, it's a single victim variable. And therefore, it will always have one value. And both the threads will see that value. So therefore, uh, that kind of deadlock will not occur. But what probably Sandeep is suggesting is that what if thread one comes in, it says that victim equal to me, but then, and it's just waiting for victim equals equals me, right? So there is no other thread, but it is just waiting for uh, somebody else to remove that uh, uh, victim. And uh, that is not called as a deadlock, but that is called as something else, right? Uh, also, it is not called live lock. Live lock means that two threads find that there is a conflict and then they go back and they find that there is conflict again and then they try again and again find conflict and so on. This is called as a live lock. So they are not stuck at one place. They are trying to do something, but that still the useful work doesn't really get there. Uh, volatile reads and writes are slow. Yes, that is correct. So uh, compared to the individual, the, the regular reads, writes, Volatile reads and writes are going to be slow. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to uh, avoid that problem. In almost all the synchronization protocols, we will need to depend upon volatile variables. Uh, in fact, it becomes crucial to use them. Harshil says, what happens when both the threads run at the same time? Even if both the threads run at the same time, victim equal to me will be done by both the threads. And one of them will succeed. One of them will overwrite the other. So the value of victim as checked in the next one will always be one of the two. Okay. Um, it will not happen that you uh, one thread sees the value, right? So uh, uh, is it possible that, for example, mutual exclusion is violated? For example, is it possible that uh, zero thread says uh, victim equals equals one, right? And therefore it says that, OK, I'm not the victim. I'll go ahead. And thread one sees victim equals equals zero. Right? Is that possible in any uh, ordering? So that is not going to happen because uh, both the threads might say victim equal to zero or victim equal to one. But that victim equal to one is coming from the other thread. And I am checking that here. Right? So thread zero expects that thread one has written it. And if thread one has written it and thread zero is checking it, then the check of thread zero is preceded by its own right. And therefore, 
of, and the check of threat one is going to be after uh, uh, victim equal to one is done. And therefore, there is a sequential ordering that you can guarantee between victim equal to zero and uh, while victim equals equals one. And if that checking uh, that sequential dependency you can guarantee, then and the other way around, then you can say that it will never happen that mutual exclusion is violated and both the threat C uh, 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 are in the critical section. Um, Sandeep says, yeah, uh, is it called uh, starving? Yes, that is called starving. So it's uh, an issue with respect to the starvation. That is what uh, uh, this code does not guarantee. Um, right. So I'm going to say in lock while checks if victim equals me and victim equal to me is set before going to while loop. Hence, any threat trying to lock will be stuck there itself. That is correct. So uh, uh, that is essentially the starvation part. Right? If there is no other threat to rescue me, then I'm stuck in this way. Okay. Good. Um, if the threats keep on taking locks repeatedly, then kind of in more practical scenarios, it might go well. But theoretically, there is starvation. Uh, and victim needs to be volatile. So what this we are calling as version 2. The version 1 was using different two different flags. Right? So, uh, okay, let me take this question. Chidma says, can you explain again what is volatile variable? Okay, let's take a simple variable which is not volatile. If that is a variable which is used in some computation, then it's possible that the compiler can optimize it. Away. For example, if I talk about this particular code, right? if victim is not volatile, what will the compiler do? It will look at this victim equal to me. Oh, okay. And then while victim equals equals me, that seems to be always true because the compiler is looking at it as a sequential program. So victim equals equals me is always going to be true. And if that is the case, this statement becomes while true, infinite loop. And therefore, it will say that, oh, the critical section as well as unlock part, these are all unreachable code. Let me remove it. That is an optimization, right? So dead code elimination. Uh, to avoid this thing from happening, we have to say that Yes, while victim equals equals me is an infinite loop possibility, but I am writing a parallel program and some other threat, some other context is going to possibly update that shared memory location. And to tell that one way to signify to the compiler that this victim is a shared variable, we mark that as a volatile so that the compiler disables optimizations with respect to this variable, which means that when you say victim equals equals me and there is a constant propagation happening here, uh, it will avoid that constant propagation. And therefore, it will say that, OK, this victim equals equals me should not be considered as a constant. It is probably going to be some change which might happen from other thread. I'm not going to look at it. Let me optimize the rest of the program. Right? So that is what the volatile is going to be. Um, science says, why in unlock phase victim equal to me again? Oh, that is because victim equal to other has happened. When victim equal to me was the case, at that time I was actually waiting. If I am in the critical section, which is after the lock, then that means that victim equal to other is true. So I need to set it back so that the other thread gets the chance to execute its own critical section. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So what we are going to do is to put these two versions together. How? So we'll say that we'll use the flag also to indicate that somebody is available because this is leading to starvation. In context of that flag, we were getting into deadlock, but there was no starvation. Even if the other, if the other threat does not exist, then flag of other will be false. So I can make use of that. But then I also want only one of them to enter, and I don't want that deadlock. So I'm going to combine these flags of the two, which indicates their interest in entering the critical section, as well as the victim to indicate which one should enter. OK? And since victim is a single variable, only one of them will enter, which will ensure mutual exclusion. Right? So with that hope, I'm going to write version 3, which has both the flags as well as the victim. OK? I say that my. Thread ID is TID, the other thread is other, 
I say that I am interested in entering the critical section, and the victim is me as a good thread. And then, apart from checking that as long as I am the victim, I should wait, I also check if there is other thread. Lag of other is going to be true only if the other thread set it to true. And this ensures that there is no uh, deadlock as well as there is no star waste. Okay. So this particular code ensures mutual exclusion. It does not lead to deadlock. It is starvation free. And in the end, I just need to set flag of TID equal to false. I can as well set victim equal to me, but that is not required because as long as this condition is false, I don't even need to check this condition. Okay. So I would like you to uh, take a minute, look at this code, and if you find any issues, please uh, highlight. All right. So unlikely that you will find some issues because this is uh, 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 an important uh, algorithm in the synchronization, which is called as Peterson's law. Right? So this particular implementation is Peterson's lock implementation, which gets used only for two threads. Now, on CPUs, there could be tens of threads. We said that on GPUs, there could be thousands of threads. How am I going to use Peterson's lock for that? No, so Peterson's lock cannot be used for that. There is a generalization of Peterson's lock called Bakery's algorithm, which we need to use for that reason. But there are other ways in which you can ensure locks, right? And that is what, uh, so uh, always remember that so far, whatever we discussed, we did not have any atomic instructions. There was no barrier. With atomic instructions and barrier, things become a little simpler. But to appreciate atomics and barriers, it's important to understand this basic concept of how log gets implemented. Okay? Otherwise, that atomic and log becomes kind of a, a black box. OK, so let's uh, uh, move towards atomics now. So we said that uh, atomics are primitive operations whose effects are visible either completely or none at all. Okay? Uh, these are dependent on the hardware, and uh, CUDA supports multiple atomic instructions, like atomic compare and swap atomic minimum, atomic add, etc., where atomic minimum and atomic add are all for two variables, right? So I'm going to find the minimum between x and y and assign it to some x. It's not that minimum out of a uh, uh, range of elements, right? It's only for two variables. Similarly, atomic add is going to atomically add one value to some address, uh, and it's not an addition of a vector of elements. Uh, interestingly, both uh, global and shared memory support atomics. So uh, let's understand it with the example that we have been talking about, that there is a kernel which is called with a single thread in a thread block, but there are two thread blocks. Okay. And what does that, so x is CUDA malloc, etc. And I call this, and what does this do? It just increments that variable. The expectation is that its value should be 2, but as we have discussed, its value need not be 2. And the reason that happens is that uh, uh, plus plus x of 0 is not a single instruction. It gets split into multiple instructions, load, increment, and store typically. And therefore, there is a possibility that I might do the interleaving of these two threads in arbitrary manner and might end up seeing a value other than 2, although the expected value is 2. I might see that the uh, value 2, but I might see value 1 also. Any questions on this example? OK. Uh, one question I have is, uh, yeah, so this uh, I'll skip. Uh, what if the kernel configuration is one common? Can somebody tell me what are the possible values uh, at the end of this kernel? Sandeep says there is no race. OK. Any other suggestions? 
because thread zero and thread one are in the same work. That is correct. Thread zero and thread one are in the same work. That is correct. But whether there is a race or not, you have to think. And what will be the final value? Abhishek says there is a race. Chinmay says one warp, so x will be one because of lockstep. Science says it can be two, three, or four. Abhishek says updates are to global memory. Yes, you can think that this is a CUDA malloc global memory. Okay, Sandeep has agreed with us that there is indeed a race because the stores will happen simultaneously, although the loads are read only. So you are loading the value of x0. That is read only, so there is no race, but the stores, there are two writes happening to the same memory location, and therefore there is a race. Okay, that is correct. The final value will depend upon the last writer, and therefore the values possible are within. In this case, actually, like if your thread one is the last writer and it reads x zero, so it will be one. Mm -hmm. And if thread two is executing, suppose thread one completed first, it uh, incremented x to one. And then thread two reads loads that value, and it find out two. And then during the store, it may happen like thread two store is completed first, so two is written, and then thread one store is written. So the final updated value will be one in this case, which will be incorrect because the update of thread two is lost. And the same can happen like uh, thread uh, once store is completed first followed by thread to store in that case the value in the global memory will be two sure thank you uh, so what uh, this particular case vipin is going to happen if the launch configuration is two one where the threads are independent in that case you are right that the value can be one or two but in this one comma two launch configuration where they are executing in lockstep both the loads will happen together so they both will load to their own registers the value at simultaneously right at the same time both will increment their own registers and this instruction will complete and then both of them will write to the common memory location and both of them are going to write value one both of them are going to write value one one of them is going to succeed and therefore, we will always see the value 1 at the end of this execution, if it's 1, 2 or 1, 32. So uh, this you would want to check uh, on your GPU. But this is an interesting aspect which uh, reveals uh, the SIMD nature. OK. Another example is that there are twins at the ATM. And I mean, if you felt that that plus plus x of 0 is big deal it is one or two well it can also happen in uh, real life where uh, the current balance is let's say thousand and uh, twins withdraw thousand rupees from parallel atm simultaneously and if the system executes these steps check if the balance is greater than or equal to thousand if yes reduce balance by thousand and give the cash to the user otherwise issue error then this check might happen simultaneously on both the atms that and the balance is thousand right and then yes is given to both the atms and therefore they end up giving cash to the user which is thousand this side thousand this side right and then both of them the twins get two thousand rupees although the balance was thousand right so this is uh, something which is important in the real life and we have to ensure that the checking of balance and reduction in the cash must happen atomically so that is what is the main uh, takeaway. So that gets implemented using something called as atomic increment in this case. Uh, so we say that atomic increment and the address. Right? So that is the syntax. The address is uh, address of x of 0. Or you can just write x there. That is also fine. So uh, that is going to ensure that the value 
at the end of this kernel execution is always going to be two. It will never be one. In general, when you launch it with K1, K2, it will ensure that if the original value is zero, the final value is incremented by K1 into K2, irrespective of in which order you execute thread, irrespective of how you have decomposed the threads into different thread blocks. That is, whether it is K1, K2 or uh, uh, K1 by 2 into 2, K2, etc., assuming that there is no truncation happening. So as long as there are K1 into K2 threads organized in any way, the value will always be K1 into K2. Right? So that is the deterministic guarantee that uh, uh, an atomic instruction can give. Any questions on this? All right. Uh, yeah, this effect will be visible at the end of the kernel. We cannot guarantee that it will be visible in between the kernel to different threads. It will be visible at the end of the kernel uh, in this particular example. Okay, coming back to our shortest part, right? So we said that updating C in parallel will be a problem. So we'll have to ensure that checking of the condition and uh, updating should be atomically done. And that essentially is atomic MIM instruction, which also takes an address and a value and checks if the current value at the address is less than alternative value. If yes, then it uh, does not change the value. If not, then it changes the value to alternative distance. Right? So all of these two, three steps are done atomically. That is, you will see either the old value of distance of n or the new updated value, which is going to be uh, either the same value or updated with alternative distance, whichever is the mean. Um, and therefore, this particular condition becomes a little redundant, although it is kept here for performance reasons. That is, atomic instructions are costly than the usual reads and writes. And therefore, you might want to precede this condition anyway, although it, the code will work irrespective of what atomic, um, even if you don't have this particular condition. All right. Uh, any questions so far? OK, then we are ready to implement locks. Okay. So uh, atomic cache, which is usually considered to be mother of all the atomic instructions. OK. Present it again. Right. So the atomic cache, the syntax is this that I give again a memory location. All the atomic instructions are going to be dealing with some memory location, right? So that memory location needs to be given. If the value inside this address is same as x, then I change it to y compare and swap i compare the value of at this address with x and if yes then i update it to y if not i do not change it okay. and whether i change it or not i return the old value out of this atomic case right. so that is the that is the syntax and the meaning of atomic case that is i return the old value so why do i return the old value because different threads are doing atomic cache simultaneously. Based on the old value, I will be able to figure out as a thread if my update was successful or not. If the old value is same as x, then my update was not successful. If old value is different, uh, sorry, sorry. If old value is same as, uh, Yeah, if the old value is same as x, then that means that this condition was satisfied and therefore it is updated, yeah, uh, updated with y. If the old value is different than x, then there was no such update, right? So that is correct, yes. Thanks, uh, 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 Soumya and Sandeep. So, uh, yeah, using this old value, I'll be able to figure out if I am successful or not in updating the value, right? So using this, we would like to implement 
uh, yeah, so that is the semantics. Old equal to var. If var equals equals x, then var equal to y. Otherwise, return old. So where, yeah. Um, and using this, we can implement locks, uh, which we are going to implement on the next slide. We can also implement single. Uh, for example, in OpenMP, there is this single notion, which is like there is a block of code which needs to be executed once. It doesn't matter which thread executes, but it needs to be executed once exactly. So that is called as a single construct. So you can also use atomic instructions to implement that and other atomic variants. For example, using atomic cas, you might be able to implement atomic min, atomic increment, etc. So let's see how uh, uh, to implement locks using atomic cas. And I would like you to think about for a minute or a few seconds that how will you implement it? And then we'll discuss it on the next slide. Okay, so any suggestions on how will we implement lock using uh, an atomic gas? Shomik says atomic increment flag, uh, then execute the critical section and then atomic decrement flag. Okay, sure. Any other suggestions? OK, so meanwhile, I'll just discuss with show, show me. So one issue with this is that uh, the other threads are not getting blocked. Right? What you want, essentially, is that if the value of flag is 0, right, then only uh, that person should end. So in this case, essentially, mutual exclusion is not guaranteed because multiple threads will end up entering the critical section. So message while atomic gas percent where x y not equal to x, then what? So let's just the original and should keep on going. Some code which is required. If this is satisfied, then the thread should keep on waiting. Otherwise, it can proceed. Right? It will be satisfied for only but one. This is on the right line because there is now a blocking possible with this. Because you require that while loop or some loop to ensure that there is a blocking. Right? Because the locks are blocked. Okay, so we are going to discuss exactly the same on the next slide. So will this work? Atomic cas ampersand lock where zero one. Right, so I say that the original value of, let's say, that lock variable is zero, and I'm just going to check if that is zero and set it to one. Unfortunately, this code does not ensure mutual exclusion because every thread is going to execute this code. It will just set uh, a lock where if it is zero, then set it to one. Otherwise, it remains whatever it was. Right. Um, so that doesn't ensure mutual exclusion because every thread executes it and starts entering the critical section. So I'm going to check it, change it to what if that value is equals equals uh, uh, zero, then enter the critical section. Right? So that is uh, uh, one possibility. But this particular code, although it enters the critical section for only one thread, it and ensures uh, mutual exclusion. It does not ensure that the other threads get blocked. Because locks are blocky. Uh, yeah, Sandeep has written some code while atomic has 0, 1 equals equals 1. You wait. Okay. And then in the end, you set it to lock equal to uh, 1. Uh, actually, you want that uh, lock equal to 0 in the unlock case. Uh, and you wait as long as it is non zero. That seems to be okay. Right, so we'll need that while loop. 
So we'll do something like this, that we'll return the old value. And if that old value is not equal to zero, then I'm going to wait. So that value becoming zero indicates that there is no other threat. If that value is non-zero, it means that there is some thread in the critical section. So this becomes an implementation. I mean, in a succinct manner, you can implement it the way uh, uh, Soumya and Sandeep have suggested. Right. So that is an implementation of atomic lab. Now, is this the correct code? You have to think about it a little bit and then tell me, is this the correct code? Okay, so there is something peculiar about this code, right? So, in fact, it is a correct code, but it is a correct code on the CPU. Right? Uh, it also works on the GPU across war, but when you are within a war, two threads within a war, if they execute this particular code, can you think of what will happen? The question is, if two threads of a warp execute this lock code, what will happen? Chinmay says, if the value of old is not zero, it will be in the loop forever. Uh, that is true, but we expect that some thread, I mean, initially the lock where is zero, that we can assume, and then every thread during unlock uh, sets the value to zero, right? So unlock code I have not shown, but essentially it's uh, uh, going to be lock var equal to zero. So maybe that case will be taken care of. Uh, Sandeep says thread divergence comes into picture. Uh, where does it come, uh, Sandeep? Sir, I think, uh, suppose there are 32 threads executing this uh, code and uh, Suppose one gets the old value not equal to zero, mm -hmm. and that that particular thread want to move ahead, mm -hmm. but due to this uh, remaining threads, so it is simply fashion red. So these remaining threads are not ready actually. So they have to loop again. So this will I think this will not result that uh, they will loop forever because the thread which want to go will implement no, and the other threads will keep on executing this will uh, they anyway don't get the lock okay so that's an interesting uh, observation right so we said that this is lock implementation followed by critical section and then there will be some unlock code at the bottom okay so let's understand how it is going to happen for two threads within the same wall okay so let's say that one thread enters it finds that lock where is zero and it sets it to one so the old return is zero for that thread and therefore old value not equal to zero is false uh, because it is equal to zero and therefore it wants to enter critical section. The other thread of the warp, since this statement is atomic, it is going to see the value as one. So which means that out of these two threads, only one thread is going to see the lock value to be zero, the old value to be zero. The other thread will see lock var equal to one. Okay, so now when the lock var is one, old value is one, the other thread finds this condition to be true. Okay, so one thread which is successful in locking sees this condition to be false. The other thread, or in fact all the other remaining thirty-one threads, will see this condition to be true, and because of that, they are now going to loop into this do while loop until they are able to see the old value to be zero. Okay, so all these 31 threads are going to wait. Now, according to the SIMD execution, we said that they all execute in lockstep, which means that until this particular construct is over, right? So this critical section is at the outermost level, right? So it's not inside any if condition or do while, right? it's outside. 
which means that all the 32 threads should execute the critical section. Now, if only one thread has succeeded and it is, it, want, it is wanting to go into the critical section, it cannot go. And other 31 threads have not gotten the lock variable to be zero, and therefore they are stuck in the do while. This is a deadlock. Okay. So this code works on the CPU, but it will not work on the GPU. Right? At least not within a while. And we might have to remodel it to ensure that it uh, works on the GPU as well. Right. So one of the ways in which this can be done is that you can bring in the critical section inside that do file. Okay, so as soon as you check, as soon as you get the old value, you check that immediately within that do while. So you modify the structure. If that value is zero, then you enter the critical section and then unlock and have the while loop outside. So that when the uh, locking thread achieves this uh, uh, old equal to zero, it executes this. And since this condition is true only for one thread out of the warp, but the warp is still going to meet at this place within the loop itself. And by the time it reaches here, the variable is unlocked. And therefore, at this stage, when you check, again, this condition is checkable by all the threads. And then you can proceed and the other thread can lock it and so on. Right. So it might require 32 iterations or more number of it. Uh, well, in this case, it will require exactly 32 iterations of this do while loop to ensure that all the 32 threads get to lock the variable, uh, get to lock for the critical sets. Any questions on this? Is this, this problem understood? Sir, here we are, uh, whichever gets the lock, it will update the lock, right? So lock where is put to zero again. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, I did not understand why exactly it will stop at 32. Can you re once explain that? Yeah, so when multiple threads are accessing this statement, at least one of them will see the value zero. And therefore, in every iteration of this do while loop, at least one thread will make progress. Does that seem reasonable? And therefore, for 32 warp threads, 32 iterations will be required. It won't require more number of iterations, is what I'm saying. Yes, sir. But uh, the critical section is inside the if loop, uh, sorry, if statement or after the while loop? No, no. It is within the if block, inside the while loop. OK. OK, sir. Yeah. So we have, uh, we could not now abstract away the lock right uh, the lock implementation actually includes the critical sets there is also an expectation here that the other th i mean the same thread well it should probably not we might have to guard this statement because the same thread might end up taking the lock again and again uh, although that is usually not the uh, uh, real case because typically you are interested in one lock you will do the work and then process so that we might have to guard in which case actually the number of iterations will be 32 otherwise if the same thread takes it then you might require 30 more than 32 number of uh, iterations so is this old is uh, private to each thread that is correct yes old is private to each thing then uh, why would the uh, okay sir Any other questions? Right. So as I had warned you that this synchronization topic is a little involved and we have to uh, continue focusing. So please keep doing that. Right. So now can you implement single with atomic gas? We said single is a construct which requires that one thread should enter exactly one thread, but it doesn't matter which thread enters. That be done with atomic gas. In GPU, yes, in GPU, yes.
I think the code will work both on CPU and GPU. Yeah, on GPU. Okay, so uh, I hope some of you were able to think about it. The uh, single implementation is going to be relatively okay. Abhishek says we can sync the local value and then check on the synced value to check if exactly one has already executed. Uh, so synchronize on local value means what? Uh, I mean that. Uh... Uh, even we, we want a construct which will ensure that a critical section is executed by exactly one thread, right? So, uh, right now we are able to capture old value which is local to each thread, uh, and the other threads don't know about uh, in some way the world is capturing that uh, one is trying to enter the critical section. We can, we can make that happen, I mean, use that variable sync it across all the threads and then uh, if the value of sync uh, sync variable is some then we can ensure that okay like, let's uh, okay i understand uh, what you are trying to do uh, officially so that seems to be interesting that the old value which is currently we are saying is local if that can be made common and the other threads are able to see that value then that is going to ensure that uh, um, uh, that uh, only one thread uh, enters it uh, is interestingly the lockware variable is actually doing it and lockware variable is shared so you might want to actually sync with respect to that uh, yeah sandeep go ahead sir i think if we remove this do while loop uh, like uh, delete the first line do and while so if you consider a warp, then uh, the world will be zero for only one thread. I think that will suffice your case that single, but I'm not sure the across blocks, but I'm sure in within block. Yes, so that is correct. And that is precisely what we need to do. So instead of a while loop, uh, the way uh, we were suggested uh, with some and Sandeep's code earlier, right? So while atomic gas ampersand lock zero one equals equals uh, one, then you wait. Instead of that, we just set it to if condition. And that is going to give you the implementation of single, which in turn is quite similar to what Abhishek was uh, projecting, that that old value, if it gets synced up. So essentially, that is what is going to happen uh, in, a, in an intuitive way. OK, sounds good. right? So that is essentially what this is. Uh, just that we have to ensure that there is no unlock there. That is, lock pair should not be set to 0, because we want only one thread should uh, uh, enter it. And that can happen at any point in time. And later, none of the other threads should go ahead. Uh, by the way, this uh, atomic cache works on both global memory as well as uh, shared memory. OK, we'll quickly do one exercise to ensure that we understand different aspects of GPU computing and the atomic. So please read this code and think about what will be the output of this code in terms of these printers. Yeah, CUDA memset essentially sets the value of a variable to zero, right? So there is an allocation happening as a uh, variable g or gg, and then I'm invoking two blocks. Uh, so there are two warps executing, and uh, initial value of g is 0, then what all happens because of this atomic cache that we have to uh, understand. Right? So CUDA memset is only for initialization. So assume that uh, gg equal to 0 before this kernel begins.
Okay, so uh, what does the first printf print? What are the possible values of uh, this? Just give me a minute. Okay, so science is zero. Any other suggestions? So I'm assuming what you are saying is thread zero succeeded one is what it will print. Okay, so uh, there are two warps running right uh so Lakshmi says first printer will succeed suppose say for tid x gg equal to x now and second printer will not succeed third printer will succeed for tid x plus abhishek says it may be any thread in one of those yes so that's a uh, uh, good uh, analysis right so uh, let's understand what this means right so some thread out of these 64 threads right two watts it updates this gg to whatever is the thread id plus one and the second printf is not going to be uh, executed by any thread because we are saying if gg equal to zero then set it to this since it has already been incremented this value is always going to be above zero thread id plus one is always going to be one or more therefore no thread is going to see the value of g to be zero so this second printf is not executed at all then we are going to check which thread id matches with the previous value of gg now this thread id is going to be the next thread id right so if let's say thread id 10 has updated the value of zero it will set it to 11. That means thread 11 will see the value of gg to be the same as its thread id and it will set it to minus 1. Okay. So this is going to work for all the threads from uh, 0 to 30. But if it would have been the last thread which was setting the value, then it is going to set it to 32 and there is no thread 32 and therefore nothing will happen. So third printf may get executed if the update first update to gg was done by 0 to 30 threads. If the first update was done by 31st, I mean uh, ID uh, thread with ID 31, then the third printf will not be executed. So that is what I have written here. Uh, yeah, can you tell what atomic chaos returns? Atomic chaos returns the old value of uh, the GG variable. So let's say that initial, so only one thread will see the value zero, right? So if let's say thread 10 updates it to 11, right? then thread 10 is going to see the value zero. All other threads will see the value 11. So thread 10 will see old equal to zero and all others will see the old equal to 11. That is what it means. Any other questions here? Okay, so it, it is important that you understand this particular uh, example. It reveals multiple things related to warp processing as well as atomics. So you might want to uh, read that a little later. Okay, let's come to the barriers part, right? So a barrier, we said, is a program point, right? So we all are going to Europe, and then we sync up at Delhi, and then go further from there together. So a barrier is that program point where all the threads need to reach before any thread can proceed. Right? End of a kernel is an automatic barrier because all the GPU threads must finish there. 
earlier there was no global barrier but now there is a grid dot sync available which you can use as a global barrier within a thread block also there is a possibility of a barrier which is called as underscore underscore sync threads as we were discussing how about barrier within warp threads Any thoughts on how will you implement barrier within box sets? Okay, so maybe it was too easy a question to be answered. So yeah, warp threads are always synchronized and therefore there is no need of a barrier there, right, as Abhishek is suggesting. So they are always uh, uh, synchronized. Okay, so let's take one quick example where we have uh, some assignment happening, right, vector of id equal to id, that is our statement S1, then there is sync threads. And then uh, if id is less than the problem size, uh, not only problem size, id is less than problem size minus one, the vector size minus one, because I'm going to access id plus one, therefore this condition is required as safeguard, uh, not equal to id plus one, then sync threads does not work. What do you think will be the output of this code for an arbitrary uh, uh, launch configuration? Will it print uh, sync threads does not work or will it not print? To understand what is happening right so each thread is assigning its own uh, id to a vector in parallel right? and uh, if id is less than the so all the threads except the last one is going to check if the next uh, element contains the next threads id or not right after a single thread and we would like to check if uh, uh, that will print or not. So Sandeep says it will print the statement that is uh, sync threads does not work. Uh, Satya Bhagwan says it may print if it is in the other block. So mix of sync threads work within the block. Correct. So uh, you are right that all of you are right that uh, sync threads is within a thread block. And uh, whereas the processing we are doing is a could be across thread blocks and therefore there is a possibility that within a thread block this will never happen but across thread blocks this can happen where s1 might not have finished execution while the s2 is beginning of something else so across thread blocks when you try to access at that time there will be an issue and the printf might get executed good um so sync threads when we say is a barrier it's about control so there are two parts one is the data and another is the control control is about the execution the flow whereas data is about the the variables that we have so sync threads is not only control synchronization that is the threads must meet at this point right it's also about data synchronization what that means is that whatever are the updates before sync threads those are also visible after the sync Okay, so and that is precisely what we said in this case. Sync thread is not only that the threads meet at this point, it also ensures that whatever the updates being done, those are visible at the uh, after this barrier to the thread block, uh, to the thread block threads, right? Not outside the thread block because it is sync thread. It's a barrier within a thread block. Whereas if this is a global barrier, then it can be ensured that this particular printf will never be executed if this would have been a global value so uh, that uh, in fact if you just want to do a data synchronization and do not want to do control synchronization then there is a special instruction called as memory fence or thread fence which can be utilized for this purpose okay. mm. so sync threads is a data synchronization point also and control synchronization point also, and it executes a memory fence or a thread fence for all the threads within that block. Okay. 
um, and there is a thread fence block and there is a thread fence for the whole set of GPU threads. Same go ahead. Sorry, uh, sir, can you go to the previous slide once? Yeah, sure. Uh, sir, earlier you told that uh, there may be a cache coherence problem that one thread is writing that may not uh, at that some data location, but other thread which it wants to read may not get the data. So are you saying that if, uh, suppose this thread ID is uh, changing the location at, uh, changing some data at vector location at zero and uh, some other thread and although this instruction is executed suppose but it is not reflected in the data global data so are you saying that the other thread which it wants to access this data at zero is not uh, getting the right data like yes that is what i am saying provided it is not ensured by the programmer as an additional uh, uh, safeguard which in this case is this sync threads or any other barrier. So the CUDA uh, guarantees that if you have a barrier like this, like sync threads or global barrier, then it is ensured that appropriately those threads will be able to see it. Other threads, it doesn't guarantee. Those threads in the sense, threads in a blo uh, block. Yeah, if it is sync threads, then threads in that particular block. If it is a global barrier, then all the other things. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, then uh, taking to your, uh, taking your point to the graph example, you are modifying the distance, right? So you are modifying the distance of some node, and uh, we may want that the distance may be reflected in the uh, thread of another thing, right? So the code which we have written that is atomic min so you are saying there might be any fence to write the data very good so we require a fence to make sure that that data is reflected and thankfully that is the reason that the atomic instructions all the atomic instructions they involve a memory fence in them there is a default memory fence in the atomic Yes. In the implementation of atomic, there is a thread fence required. That is correct. And not only the data which is uh, which atomic is accessing, the data all which it has encountered until the atomic is in, uh, like there may be some... no, no, not with atomic. With atomic, only that part is guaranteed. Uh, other data may get synchronized, may not get synchronized. Only the data which is sent to atomic, like in as that, a point of location, which is specified in that atomic instance, only that is guaranteed to be uh, made to the uh, uh, shared memory location. I mean, shared memory, common memory location. Otherwise, it is not guaranteed. Whereas so, we have a sync threads or a barrier, then it is guaranteed for all the writes prior to. Since we have used atomic uh, min before, so it will ensure uh, the distance is written, like in the graph thing. That is correct. Okay. Sure. Um, Abhishek says the data synchronization due to sync threads is only for active threads. Uh, what do you mean by active threads, Abhishek? Uh, sir, then I mean, uh, like yesterday you had presented a case where sync threads was an if block, right? So then, uh, body of uh, if condition. So then, if some threads are inactive, whether data sync could happen for those inactive threads also. I see, I see. Okay, so uh, that is unlikely to be implemented that way. In fact, like we were suggesting, that sync thread should ideally be implemented at the outermost level. It should not be part of an if condition, etc but uh, uh, even if it is within that if block unlikely that the implementation will just do it only for those threads it's likely to do it for all the threads because that data synchronization might not take into consideration if a particular uh, thread has been masked out or not uh, 
Yeah, so my Lakshmi's question I missed. Uh, change made by one thread in a block will not be visible to other threads in another block? No, not with sync threads. I mean, it may be visible, but it's not guaranteed. It might not be visible. Um, whereas within a thread block, it is going to be, again, within a thread block, without sync thread, it's not guaranteed. Okay. With sync threads, within a thread block, it is guaranteed that the effect is visible across. That is, right before sync threads, uh, it's value is visible to the other threads in the same thread block. Uh, science says, uh, can you explain the difference between data synchronization and memory fence? It's the same I'm saying, where I'm saying that uh, the data gets synchronized, which means that the data is made visible to the other threads. Whereas the control synchronization is only a meeting point. It's related to the control, uh, the execution of the, of the threads. Uh, it need not be directly related to the data synchronization, right? But thankfully, sync threads ensures both the data as well as control. That is, all the threads meet there, as well as the previous writes are made visible to all the threads within that thread. Okay, this is an important point. Uh, in general, a fence does not ensure that the other thread will read the updated thread. So, uh, the fence only ensures that your write is happening to the common memory, which could be DRAM. But it doesn't mean that the other thread is going to read that way. Right? For that, you might have to make from the other thread that data to be volatile. So this is something which you will require. One is ma mark the variable shared variable as volatile. Shared variable meaning the variable which is shared across threads, not the shared memory variable. So the shared variable, mark it as volatile. And the second one, after writing to it, ensure that there is a thread fence. So both these things will be required, especially in the implementation lock, implementation of lock, you will require that. So that in general case is because there are different hierarchies in memory, right? Uh, no, in general, I was talking about CPU and GPU. So uh, that case where you are doing a, you are doing a data sync, but the other thread is not reading the updated value because of memory hierarchy, right, sir? Or like, if there is no hierarchy, then that should not be the case, right, sir? That is right. It is definitely because of memory hierarchy. So if uh, there is no caching, then this problem will not arise. Right. And in GPUs, this is more relevant, right? I think GPUs, the coherence will take over and uh, make sure in some sense make sure or is there a guarantee or like it's still not a guarantee sir in your cpu uh, guarantee because of uh, in the sense that you are saying that funds does not ensure the other thread funds is used for data sync uh, like what i understand was it, it, it was supposed to happen it was supposed to be the case that if a thread executed a funds then all its data becomes global now to uh, all the threads right you're exactly. suggesting that might not be the case uh, and you are also asking us to use uh, volatile if you want to ensure that it is it, it, if it were, if you are to see that case, but that is not sitting with well with the meaning of fence is what. Uh, no, no. Okay, let me put it this way, right? So on GPUs, if you want your data to be accessible to other threads, let's say you are writing x equal to five, and you want this five value to be read by the other thread. You have to ensure that x equal to 5 is followed by a thread fence and the other thread should also be marked, uh, should also be reading this variable as a volatile variable. So, but can I can I also make this, I mean, if, if I can ensure that the read from other thread is happening after this fence, will that be enough? Uh, no, then it is not guaranteed. So if I make this as, uh, so I do x equal to 5 from one thread, there is a thread fence, and the read from the other thread happens without making volatile uh, uh, after this write, then it is not guaranteed that it will be read. It will read the value 5. It might read the old value. So we have to mark, we have to use both thread fence from the writer and volatile from the reader. Both are required. So the thread fence is ensuring that you your write is made accessible to the others, and volatile is ensuring that you are reading from that common end. 
okay i don't understand what is what is what is the meaning of making it accessible but yeah i will take it from i will try to look more for it yeah so think about it this way that uh, uh, let's say you are writing some embedded uh, program some device program and you are updating some value from one thread right and uh, you want that value to be whenever the next time the other threads read the other thread should see this value if the read happens after this right to ensure that you have to use a thread fence because otherwise the value will be written only in the local memory or maybe in the cache and it will not be reflected in the common memory it therefore we require a thread fence which we implement using a thread fence uh, underscore underscore thread fence this is going to ensure that the value is written to the main memory or some common memory however when i talk from the perspective of the other threads they are reading the value but maybe they have read the value earlier and therefore it is already cached okay got it sir got it sir thanks yeah so the thread fence is ensuring somya that the value is written all the way to the common memory which could be l2 cache or main memory yes andi sir can you like uh, when you are saying at the reading part that uh, it should be accessed as volatile so Uh, can you say in terms of like programmatically uh, are you saying that the data should be initialized as a volatile or a, that is correct we will have to mark it as volatile data so if uh, the shared memory is marked as volatile and uh, the reading is happening from the global and it is put in the volatile shared memory then wouldn't uh, this be sufficed or or the well, global data is. should be itself the volatile yeah so it doesn't suffice in at least in cuda it doesn't suffice you have to have thread fence associated with it so what we felt also uh, and that this is totally based on our experiments is that we also felt that if it is volatile then the read and write should uh, 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 be happening to the common memory location but that does not happen you have to explicitly put thread fence from the writing side and uh, anyway it has to be marked as volatile so the reading will go to the main memory the volatile seems to be related only with respect to the read in cuda according to our experiments if you do not put thread fence then the update does not get reflected okay sir sir so hello so, sir so if you do not implement the lock sir you will encounter this situation and then i think all of this discussion will start making sense so those of you who do that please try it out and let me know what your observations mm, i'll skip this uh, i'll skip this too let's come to a little bit on the reduction uh, reduction essentially means that i have a multiple set of values and i would like to reduce those to a few values typically one right and uh, the computation must be reducible which means that it must follow certain property called as associativity property which says that it doesn't matter in which order i apply the operator in this case dot is an operator right the parentheses are only used to decide the uh, order in which the uh, application of that uh, operator is done so whether i apply uh, whether i do a dot b first or b dot c first it doesn't matter as long as the operands order remains fixed and i get the same value so can you give some examples of associative uh, operations plus is an associative operation it doesn't matter whether we do a plus b plus c in whichever order addition multiplication correct any other matrix multiplication is associative right so that's an important operation which can actually be reduced i mean uh, which means that it can be useful for reduction okay good so uh, there are large number of other operations which are possible to be implemented as associative and we can also implement them using atomic instructions but uh, you can also implement them as reductions so for example i can do atomic add and keep on doing it repeatedly it doesn't matter in which order i do because we said plus is uh, uh, associative right okay so uh, it also adds sequentiality so there is slightly more parallelism that you might be able to get depending upon how big your data is if you are 
data is small then using an atomic is, is okay if the data is much larger then you might want to use a reduction which i'm going to explain so uh, how does it improve parallelism well we are uh, going to say that you are given a bunch of numbers and what i want to do is to add them right? so the way we will add it is using uh, in a sequential loop for i equal to 0 to n um, sum plus equal to a of i Right. In parallel, what I'm going to do is to do atomic add ampersand sum comma a of i. Right. So that add sequentiality. So is there a way I can do because the operation is associative? I might be able to do something like this: that I do four plus three first, nine plus three in parallel to that, then five plus seven in parallel to that, and three plus two. So I get these four numbers, and then I apply the same for these in parallel. And I get these two numbers. And then I take a sum of these and I get the final sum. Right. So this is possible to be done for associative operators. Addition is one quick example, but then all the others can be implemented in a similar manner. So we would like to implement it in this manner. How many steps does it require? If there are n numbers, it requires log n steps, where what we mean by a step is that after one particular iteration is done it needs to be separated by a barrier because for the next operation to proceed there is going to be addition of 7 and 12 going to happen which means there is a read of 7 and 12 going to happen for that the write of 7 and 12 from the previous iteration must be over and therefore we implement it using a barrier based protocol okay. so how do we implement it like this we can try to implement where um, a thread is so the number of threads is going to be initially n by two threads are required, then n by four, n by eight, like that. So, similar, so therefore, that is what this does uh, initially n by two threads. And as long as those many threads are active, I'm going to uh, apply this loop. So, all the threads which are less than that number, so initially 0 to n by two minus one, then 0 to n by four minus one, then 0 to n by eight, and so on. All those threads are active and what they are going to do is to add their value uh, with the value of the offset right and that is going to ensure that you are going to get the sum of uh, some numbers some two numbers in this and once this summation happens in every iteration there needs to be a barrier which i am using sync threads if it is within a block uh, this needs to be global barrier if it is across blocks okay any questions on this particular code yes sandeep so what is the condition sir like uh, you uh, in for loop that, uh, this condition says that how many threads are, which threads are active so the uh, like the condition the for loop uh, in the sense this one it it just says of greater than 0 yeah. okay yeah so as long as of is positive it needs to uh, go on doing it. OK. So one thing that uh, actually this did is uh, not consecutive numbers, but it did it with 4 was added with thread IDX plus off, which where off was n by 2. So 4 was added with 5. Right? Similarly, 3 was added with 7 and so on. This is how it did. And then the value was returned to as first eight numbers, then first four, first two, and then first number. So the final value of this summation of this reduction is going to be available as a of zero. So you are actually modifying the input array. Okay. I hope this part is clear. If, if there is any question, please ask. Okay. So uh, we also uh, have an assumption that n must be power of 2, which can be taken care of sometimes by padding it with zeros to ensure that it is power of 2, etc. Uh, uh, otherwise, we might have to modify the code such that it is always within bounds. All right. So uh, can you implement this reduction as this? This I'm going to skip, but you can try it as uh, uh, an exercise, although I do have the code corresponding to that. So instead of summing up the uh, off elements, you are going to sum up the last two and then the 
uh, next to them and so on so that can be done by changing the offset a little bit i'll skip that uh, so this is also fine I mean, there's just different ways in which the reductions could be implemented right uh, and one another example of a reduction is our associative operation is string concatenation which is not uh, commutative right similar to matrix multiplication whereas addition multiplication are also commutative whereas matrix multiplication string concatenation are not commutative so you can try implementing uh, string uh, operations i'll skip this prefix sum for now uh, in the interest of time so let me keep the slide here and uh, let's take up your questions yes sir go ahead so uh can you want to go to the next slide? Uh, you have told that, yes, sir, this pattern. So even this pattern is not the good uh, pattern, right, in terms of memory coalescing, because you are trying to access the uh, values which are at far, like if you say, if you take four, three. So uh, uh, like, can we do two into thread ADX and two into thread ADX plus one, which will access the two adjacent? Maybe I need to, little I need to be a little careful, but uh like you have drawn a tree right in the log and fashion and in terms of memory accessing also that would be great i guess okay so let's first understand uh, whether this particular pattern is not coalesced or coalesced right so we said that a particular thread id might be accessing four and then it might access two but then while it is accessing four the next thread is also accessing three and the next to that is accessing nine and three so these are actually coalesced as far as this part is concerned they are accessed in an opposite order but we said that any arbitrary order is okay and therefore that access will also turn out to be coalesced. is that reasonable sandeep yes sir yeah uh, going back to our diagram where we had this kind of access this is also coalesced because the read here and the read here is anyway going to expand to the uh, appropriate work. So that will also remain coalesced. Sir, in the performance wise, if you, uh, like in the previous pattern and in the uh, like the binary fashion, there would be no considerable uh, advantage of doing like binary thing? Uh, there will be. Uh, for example, in fact, uh, the original pattern that we showed here where we were one thread was summing these two and then another thread was summing these two and so on this actually has reduced codes right so whatever we are saying as thread id into two uh, and thread id into two plus one this has half codes because when i'm accessing four the other thread is accessing nine and the other thread is accessing five and three right so our uh, uh, stride is two and therefore the coalescing becomes half. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So any other uh, concerns, questions? So even the uh, like the strided. Uh, you were adding like strider like array of uh, thread ID plus of even there would be the policing will be half only I guess because each thread is accessing two uh, values right if you take as a 32 and uh, each thread will be accessing two values so it will be uh, you are muted yeah, so that part is okay because if, when I'm accessing these two, I'm first reading one, right? So all the walk threads will do the read. And then all the walk threads will do the second read. Is that okay? So the first read will be coalesced and the second read will also be coalesced. Okay, so.
so there is nobody else at home and cylinder came at the right time so uh, i had to juggle that okay so there is uh, control synchronization would imply data synchronization if not why because of the data hierarchy technically uh, control synchronization can be different from data synchronization for example if i mean in in general in parallel programming although in the context of gpus they happen together for example i might decide that uh, when the control synchronization i mean the threads are meeting at this point maybe their writes are not really written back such that they are visible after the barrier so control synchronization can be different uh, in a tech, uh, in a, a, uh, in an extreme case but that is not very useful uh, the reason being that when the threads synchronize usually they expect that the writes before and the reads later have some dependence so otherwise there is no real point of meeting at that place right so but yes it's possible that uh, this could be different in the context of gpus the control synchronization is also ensuring that there is data synchronization but the other is other way around is not true where the data synchronization happens because of uh, thread friends it does not mean that they have uh, control synchronization right so thread friends is only about data it does not ensure any control synchronization any other concerns questions all right so then we'll have to stop here and tomorrow we'll study some more aspects related to kura right see you bye i'll stop the recording now